Hello, everybody. How was the keynote for you guys? Good? Cool. Thank you very, very much uh, for attending uh, AWS uh, New York Summit. Uh, I'm super excited to be here, uh, and, and, and especially because it's not only New York, but also the fact that I get to speak about the topic that I'm really passionate about, uh, which, is, which is optimizing for cost uh, in the AWS cloud. Uh, so welcome to the technical track. There are going to be lots of uh, uh, great technical uh, speakers, uh, solution architects, evangelists coming in and talking about a variety of different ways you can architect for scale, for high availability, for, for uh, you know, disaster recovery, and so forth. So uh, stay tuned. And there is plenty of opportunity to ask questions, uh, maybe after the session at the AWS lounge. Uh, at the Partner Expo Hall, and we would love to gather your feedback. And if you have any questions, concerns, feature requests, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I have been at Amazon Web Services uh, since almost six years now. I've been focusing, um, I'm a technology evangelist and focusing on a variety of different applications, and I love to, uh, my, my, my passion lies in architecture and cloud architectures. So I've written a couple of white papers that most of you might have uh, got a chance to read. Just Google for cloud architectures. Uh, the first link would come up. Or, or maybe architecting uh, best arch architecture best practices, which will, which will uh, tell you a few uh, white papers that we have written. And also there is AWS Architecture uh, uh, Center, which will give you more details about the, the, the data. However, I'm going to, there are, when it comes to cloud, there are multiple different ways and multiple different dimensions to optimize. Um, in this talk, I'm going to focus only on one, which is you now optimizing for cost. Uh, how do you architect for spend? How do you make sure that you can you know, further save from what you have, been, uh, you have implemented in, in your architecture in a variety of different ways? Now, the cloud computing, there is no doubt that it saves uh, you know, a lot of money for the customers who, who, would, who move into the cloud from an, when you compare it from an on-premise setup. However, now when you optimize and when you further optimize into, into your architecture, this gives you enormous flexibility as well as enormous power to the hands of a developer to make a significant impact on the, uh, on the bottom line of the, of, of the business itself in terms of savings. And this is what I really love about cloud, that it really, the architect can actually you know, think about you know, how we can save money while not you know, cutting corners on security, scalability, availability, and, and, and all the other aspects about, about the cloud. So the one thing which I absolutely love about the fact that when you turn off resources, you stop paying for them. And that has been the fundamental you know, ways of how you can save on, on the cloud. And you saw in the keynote uh, with Pinterest of how they are optimizing for costs and availability. So I'm going to talk about these different uh, variety of different strategies and five takeaways that you can take home when you're optimizing for cost. And what I have seen, and when I talk to a variety of different customers, and I've gathered some of their design patterns and best practices from, we learn from our customers as well, uh, that as you continuously optimize, there are different ways to continuously integrate, continuously optimize, as well as continuous deployment. Now, you can see recurring savings in your, as early as your next one's bill. Right? So that's the best part. If you implement a caching service and reduce the number of requests to the database or the I.O., you see immediate savings as early as your next month's bill. And that you can say with a developer in, 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 to, to your manager or a, or a business owner that that's what you know, have cost, uh, has, has made uh, the, your um, dramatic savings for your bill. And elasticity is the fundamental property of the cloud which drives most of the economic benefits. So let me dive into a few of these simple, you know, very easy to grasp, uh, optimizing for cost strategies. The first one, which is obvious in this scenario, that you, know, you only use what you, what you need. You only, you, know, you turn off anything excess that you have and kind of automate those aspects in a variety of different ways. Uh, and, and there are a variety of different 
uh, ways customers have done it. There are a variety of different strategies that we recommend. And then there are amazing amount of creativity that, that, that can go into building uh, applications that will, uh, that will um, uh, scale and optimize. So first thing when I see is optimize by the time of the day. Now, when you see every single web application, or I would say most of the web application has some sort of uh, spikiness. They have applications that uh, peak during certain time of the day, and and then and and uh, no, and they are no, uh, going down. The traffic goes down at a certain time of the day, and you will see, as you saw in Pinterest, as well in the in the keynote, that if you provision for peak capacity, which is the normal case in the scenario, and typically people spend a lot of time trying to predict that red line that they see, right? So in order to really see and understand the value the, 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 that, that the cloud can provide is, the, is that you can see the significant savings when you are aligning your traffic as closely as your demand. And, and there, are, there are cool ways to do that too. So the so first strategy that I see with customers is they are optimizing by the time of the day. So a typical example here, uh, when you have a simple three-tier web application with, with uh, no, uh, uh, web, application, web servers, application servers, and database servers, you can actually build web, web, websites that sleep at night, essentially shrink when, when they don't need to be running. So from a six-server web, web server uh, fleet, you can shrink to a two-server fleet and run minimum servers that you need to run during the night time when nobody is accessing it. So, so you know, just you know, shrinking your web servers or your app servers will automatically give you the savings that you need. And that can be achieved through you know, multiple different ways. And one of the ways is auto-scaling, which I talk about in, 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 two, in two minutes. The other strategy that I see, which is sort of optimizing by the time of the year, like if you have an application that you are expecting to, now, let's say a tax application, which will peak during the, uh, during the April time frame, or you have an e-commerce application, which will peak during, during um, the December and November time frame, if you have a promotional campaign that you know that it's going to run, uh, at a certain given point of time, and your, app, your application needs to handle that amount of demand, or if you have you know, an application which is just going to, you, know, um, you, know, you don't know, it's just going to be uncertain. You don't know how much traffic you, will, you are going to have. The, all these strategies, when you kind of combine, you optimize during the year, you, you can also see the same effect, while in, instead of um, optimizing for pre peak capacity, you essentially optimize for now, only during that time frame when you run those applications when you need it, you have significant savings. So how can you achieve that? What are the different ways customers are leveraging? One of the ways is auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is a service where it, uh, you provision a simple auto-scaling group, uh, or, or you specify in the console uh, or your auto-scaling uh, settings. If you're running uh, AWS Beanstalk, or you can specify through the command line tools that no, I want to have a launch configuration of uh, which defines your which Amazon machine image you want to you want to provision, uh, which how, what is the minimum number of AC2 instances I would like to have in an auto scaling group, what is the maximum number of EC2 instances I would like to have, and then you specify your your minimum threshold and the maximum threshold of your uh, triggers. Uh, so that means that I can set up very quickly that if the utilization or the aggregate or average utilization of my entire EC2 fleet, which are in this auto-scaling group, you know, the, the CPU utilization goes above 85% and it stays there for five minutes, cause an alarm or trigger. And by trigger, you can specify how you want to actually scale. You can scale by schedule, or you can scale by policies. Scaling by schedule is essentially during a particular time of the day, you know, during the particular time of the event that is going to happen, or, uh, or the promotional campaign that you are running, and you need, to, you need to make sure that you have enough capacity you know, 10, 10 minutes before or 10 hours before the actual promotional email goes out to all your customers. 
right? Scaling by policy is, is really saying that I want to double my capacity or I want to increase my capacity by 20% or 50% or 100% and increment in a steps of five or 10 based on, based on your requirements, right? So what this allows you to do is by specifying the launch configuration, auto scaling service will monitor your resources, make sure that the load balancer as well as the CloudWatch, which is the monitoring service, connects together as well as gives you that, that level of automatically scaling as you, as you grow, as your CPU utilization grows. Um, there are multiple different dimensions and triggers that you can set on. You can, uh, there is a way by which you can, within the CloudWatch alarms, there is a way by which you can have a custom metrics feature. Uh, so you can specify your own metrics based on like number of hits per second for your uh, web server or your application metrics or, or uh, no, no, Java heap size or whatever th that you are measuring on. Uh, you can specify that, have CloudWatch uh, meter those and, 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 and record those and create a trigger based on that and then um, uh, scale based on that particular trigger. So, how CloudWatch works is CloudWatch, load balancing, and auto-scaling all works, works together to create that effect that you need when you want to scale uh, horizontally. So uh, there are a variety of different best practices that I see when a lot of customers uh, typically uh, also have. There are a few which we have published. Uh, there are a few that are published by our customers too. Uh, one, one that I see most often being used is leveraging auto-scaling tags. So tagging allows you to identify and provide multiple different auto-scaling groups for different, different fleet size on your, on your same application. And you can specify multiple auto-scaling that will give you uh, ability to you know, kind of query them, understand what you want, and then resume and suspend those processes in case you don't want to uh, you know, uh, trigger those, those auto-scaling groups in, in certain cases. This, we hear a lot of feedback from them. The other uh, areas which I like to um, uh, focus on is the fact that you can have scale up and scale down symmetrically. So if you are scaling up by 20% uh, for your EC2 instance fleet, and so also scale back down by 20% so you don't uh, to avoid situations like capacity trashing, what Netflix calls. Uh, capacity trashing essentially is that you have more capacity than you need, and then you don't know how many, how many, how many EC2 instances have actually gone down. The third best practice that I see most of the time that people use is, as you saw in Pinterest presentation also, they have a buffer maintained between your demand as well as your uh, ex um, uh, existing uh, traffic. That buffer is really around 20 to 25% in order to just make sure that you have, if in case you get a big peak uh, during, that, uh, during this short amount of time, you have enough buffer in space, in, in time, so that your EC2 instances um, take around two or three minutes uh, to, to launch. It, it has uh, you know, the, the required time to meet that particular demand. Uh, Auto scaling can span across multiple availability zones, and that I that is uh, introducing some variety of different ways uh, of um, or ar of architecting. You have to make sure that you have enough capacity to to ha in your availability zone by making sure that either you are guaranteeing that capacity by reserved instances by purchasing reserved instances, or you are having an ability to uh, create a, um, an auto scaling group that will that will use some of the you know, different strategies which I discussed from, uh, from Spot instances side. One of the hidden best practice or the hidden feature of auto scaling group is that it will, if you specify the minimum number of EC2 instances that, is, that you need, it will, it will make sure that it maintains the healthy state of your auto scaling group. So it automatically self heals the application in a way because you're specifying minimum uh, let's say two instances or minimum one instance, as soon as it finds that the EC2 instance has, has died or it's terminated, it will automatically bring that up again and, and, uh, and make sure it maintains that inner fleet. So, so it's a great way to make sure that you have auto-scaling auto not only for 
uh, scaling up or scaling down, but also for you know, um, self-healing uh, side of applications. So you automatically fail over into a newer instance. So a typical example that I, I like to uh, highlight is, so you can specify these types of rules, right? as in scale up by 10% if the CPU utilization is greater than you know, 60%, um, or aggregate CPU across all your fleet, and then for five minutes. And then scale down by 10% if the CPU utilization is less than 30%. So if you, I typically like 20% uh, threshold uh, to be maintained above your, uh, from your uh, peak, from a desired, through, uh, uh, desired uh, level. So in order so that you maintain that particular buffer. And also, as I mentioned, 10% and 10% remain the same. So you're symmetrically scaling up and scaling down. And then you know, you're scaling up early. So you have between, if five minutes is the trigger, you want to stay that to five minutes, you create that level. And then up to 10, 20 minutes, you're scaling down slowly. So you, in case you need the capacity when you need and the traffic goes up, you have an ability to scale up. Uh, uh, quickly as well. So this is one typical best practice that a lot of customers uh, take advantage of when they, when they leverage. This is the graph of, of Netflix. Now, how do you optimize for cost, and how do you optimize this in sort of a data center or an on-premise setup today? It's not possible. Right? In, an, in an EC2 setup, you're, what you're seeing on the upper graph here is they have this aggregate C CPU of all their instances that are running on the web server fleet. And these is their step up approach of how many instances they are running. And as you can see, it's completely mimics your, your traffic as well. So they have a buffer in between. So in it, 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 all these white space that you see essentially is, um, um, is cost savings because you're only running your infrastructure when you need it. So that's one of the you know, simple uh, uh, tool or uh, uh, ways in which customers are optimizing for cost. And I highly encourage you to invest more time in, in you know, thinking about auto scaling and, and creating a way so that you can also save and further reduce your cost. The other strategy that I see most of the time is optimizing during the time of the month. So if you have, let's say, a database instance uh, which is running uh, uh, which is running, which you need to run uh, 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 for a web application or running different reports, and you want to run reports at the end of the month, or you want to do an indexing job at the end of the month. So instead of provisioning for peak capacity or provisioning a higher EC2 instance or a RDS instance in this scenario, you are, you know, you're, you're specifying, you're only, you're running a smaller instance during that time and only upgrading or scaling up vertically. Uh, during that three, four hour time frame, uh, or, or three, four days time frame. And then you will see significant savings because you're running a lower, in, lower instance type for, the rest of the, for most of the month, and then only scaling up uh, vertically when you need it. And this literally happens within one click in, the, uh, in Amazon RDS. So you, you specify your Amazon RDS uh, database, you click on it, and you have modified DB instance, and then you can specify and change your instance type, and it will go and you know, do the magic behind the scenes. It'll snapshot it, get the data, put it on the newer instance type, and then reload. So, so it's, a, it's a great way to, to make sure that you're, you're, you're you know, saving on optimizing on that cost as well. So one other benefit of you know, turning off when you don't need it is that you have reminder scripts. Right? And th these are obvious things to do, which, are, uh, which, which I think most of you might already be doing, but you know, make, making sure that you, know, you don't have any unused e EIPs, your unassociated e EBS volumes are terminated, you you're leveraging things like S3 object expiration and other features that are there, which will help you, and you can automate this whole process to very, very easily. One of the interesting ideas that I came across with one of the um, customers was, Leveraging custom metrics feature for CloudWatch to actually scale down uh, and, uh, and saving when you don't need it. So it me measures your free CPU, your free, uh, free hard disk, and your at, at one minute time intervals, and you uh, shove it inside the uh, custom metrics feature, uh, custom metrics for CloudWatch, and then 
there you go. You have like, oh, I want to just come, no, downgrade my EC2 instance from a large instance to a small instance with this CloudFormation script. So that's another interesting ideas and creativity that emerged due to this um, new ways of, of uh, you know, uh, building architectures. So that's, that's just one obvious best practice around auto scaling. And I would highly recommend you to invest more time in auto scaling. The second one, which is, uh, which is important to understand, and this is also given that reserved instances are a great way to further reduce your cost. And then I will quickly go into this. Most of you already know about the, these area that, that if you have baseline capacity and you, are, you know that, it, that, that you are going to run less than, more than 17% of your, of your uh, utilization or your time for the, running your EC2 instance, you, make, you invest in reserved instances because it's going to give you more cost savings. So, so there are, Amazon was listening to lots of customers and understanding now that not only that they need reserved instances for just plain uh, guaranteeing capacity and lowering cost, but they need it in a variety of different ways. Today, reserved instances are available for one year and three year terms, and there are three different utilization types. One is the higher utilization, lower utilization, light utilization, and the medium utilization. The medium ones are the standard ones which were there earlier. By, by making sure the light utilization are essentially a way by which you can you know, um, create for ideal situations like uh, disaster recovery, where you don't know uh, you, when the disaster will occur and you can actually spin up only during the disaster recovery time and still make sure that you have guaranteed capacity at the same time you're lowering costs. So higher utilization, uh, heavy utilization have a slightly higher uh, upfront cost, but they're significant savings when you do a three-year period or a one-year period total cost. So a typical way of, the, of how customers can think about uh, optimizations is to think about break-even points. So this is a graph for M2 uh, extra large uh, uh, Linux running in the US East region for a uh, -year, three-year period. And you can see that as you can, this is a graph against on-demand. The blue line is the on-demand, the red line is the heavy utilization, the green line is the medium, and the uh, purple line is, sorry, purple line is the light, and the uh, uh, green line is the medium instances, uh, medium utilization instances. And if you do the graph and you understand the break-even point for this particular instance type in this region is that if you run less than 10%, on-demand will be the best bet. But if you're running for 10 to 40%, light utilization will give you maximum savings and to up to 46%, uh, 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 sorry, 56% savings. Up for, if you're running and you know that you are, this is a database and you're running it for 75% of their time and you're not, never going to turn it off, then I, I would highly recommend you to leverage the heavy utilization types, which will give you maximum savings up to 71% of uh, savings. So in this case, you are, you are running, kind of uh, recommended architecture is to have mix of, mix of both, reserved as well as on demand in order to maximize your savings. So typical patterns that I see in, in, in customers is, like if you have a web application with a steady state pattern, if you have a web application with a, uh, you know, a spiky predictable pattern, or if you have a web application which is completely uncertain, unpredictable web pattern, what are the different best practices and recommendations you can have in, in, in this setup? So if you're in the case of steady state setup, I would plain you know, recommend to invest in a three-year heavy utilization because you're going to uh, run that for 100% of your time. For your spiky predictable usage where you know that you, what your spike is going to be because of your historical data, you, 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 are, uh, you know from a past setup that this, this is the only uh, this is the only spike it can go up to, then you can, you are in the on-premise setup, you are actually provisioning for peak capacity. In this one, you only provision your three-year heavy utilization instance type for your baseline while you lose on-demand for your spiking, spiky use case. And you will see maximum savings and that's a result. For your uncertain, I would recommend for your, again, baseline instances, go for heavy utilization, give you maximum savings, the minimum number of applications that you, uh, servers that you need to run um, uh, for, uh, for the application to, uh, to, uh, to uh, execute. 
And the, for your medium, you invest in a one-year um, or a three-year light utilization. So you know you can actually save on a variable aspect. If the traffic goes b below the certain, uh, certain level, you will, you will stop using reserved instances, uh, stop using light reserved instances, and sa further save your cost during that time. So a typical example of how this will work in a three-tier web application like you just saw earlier, where you have two web servers, two app servers, and two database servers in a multi-AZ setup, uh, and there are different configurations that you can have. And, and, and reserved instances is just a billing thing. It's not really, and the, your instances remain the same. Your applications remain the same. Your configurations remain the same. However, now, once you purchase a reserved instance, and if you have a reserved instance, your billing thing will change, and you will be, you will be essentially metered at that rate, but, but, uh, at a lower rate, essentially. So your typical savings for these three options, or four options, would be in this, in this way. You will see you know, maximum savings resulting in you know, heavy utilization, giving up to 54% savings over on-demand. So I highly recommend you leveraging some of those as well. So that was investing your time and in, in energy into a little bit of a you know, reserve side to understand how you can further optimize your cost. The third uh, and the most favorite of mine is one of the best ways in which you can architect for spend is to leverage spot architectures. Now, now uh, as you can see, spot is the third way you having an ability to bid for unused EC2 capacity. How many people are using spot today? Okay, a few of them, that, that's cool. So this is a great way to further optimize your cost by not having to pay up front as well as you know, um, um, getting a lower, lower fee, very close to on demand, or, sorry, very close to the reserved rate. Um, so what uh, SWOT instances are is essentially that you, give, you get an uh, ability to bid for unused EC2 capacity, and typically customers see up to 56%, uh, 56 to uh, 69% savings as a result of using SPOT. However, the trade-off is that Amazon will reclaim those resources if your SPOT price exceeds the maximum bid price. So you essentially say to uh, t tell Amazon that I'm willing to pay uh, X amount, uh, no, three cents for a small instance um, uh, for this region in this availability zone. And if you have this region available, please you know, start my EC2 instances. So there is this amazing new ways of you know, architecture that, that emerged due to that. And there are a variety of different use cases that can be enabled. So if you have logs today that you need to process, now, I would highly recommend you to simply take advantage of Spot in this, in, in this way. If you have lots of other areas like scientific computing, testing, uh, other areas where you need this additional capacity, you can also bid for that. So it's not just for only time insensitive tasks, but also for you know, if you need that excess capacity when, when you're not able to get in an on-demand setup, you can bid higher than the on-demand price and get that capacity when you need it. So what are the different strategies that are, that are bidding strategies that evolved due to that? Right? This is a simple way we publish 90-day um, uh, traffic on our console so you can predict how much, uh, what your bid price should be. So your maximum bid price is, is essentially going to be uh, what you request for. However, one thing to note, and this is a question that comes up all the time, is that is Amazon going to charge me at the maximum bid rate, bid, uh, bid price, or is it going to be lower? It's always going to be the spot price that Amazon will be charging you, uh, when, you when, your when your servers are started. So you always, I will recommend you to um, uh, bid for maximum price, your threshold, but and because you know that whatever is the spot price, Amazon, if it's lower than the spot, uh, the current rate, it will it will provision that infrastructure, and then uh, you can run those uh, queries again. Typically, we have seen that the spot price ranges between the reserved hourly price uh, and the on-demand price. So, so your setup can be built in a way that will give you maximum savings. So let's see what are the different bidding strategies that come due to, due to this effect. There are a variety of different applications that can be built from scientific computing, big data, as you saw, uh, as well as you know, testing and running Hadoop jobs on, on, on spot. So 
there are three or four obvious strategies that come out of it, but each one has its own pros and cons. And, and, and I would highly recommend you taking uh, the one that will, that will work for you. The first one is really, um, oops, I, I meant, okay. First one is really bidding near the reserved price. In this setup, you will ha get the maximum savings because you are bidding at the reserved rate, uh, but your it, the time to complete your job might be extended because you might not get those EC2 instances in the first place. The second, second one is really around, oops, the second one is really around um, bidding for uh, the spot price history itself. So this is the bid, bid distribution from the last six months that we got and to understand how customers are really bidding. And you see that the second bid price is about around the spot price history. They're looking at over 90-day 90, 90 period, uh, finding out how many EC2 instances, or what is the price going on, and they bid around that. So above a little bit of reserved rate, but below the on-demand price. And you can see the 100% is actually the on-demand rate, and there are maximum number bid. In, in, in this setup, you are, you are bidding at the on-demand rate or around the on-demand rate. By doing that, you know that you can easily you know, switch over to on-demand in case you don't get spot instances provisioned. So that's the best way, and as you can see, most of the customers bid around that area where they can you know, bid for on-demand and then get a lower price and see maximum savings around that. Oops, sorry about this. And the last setup is the bid above the on-demand price. So if you see that you need that capacity right now, and you need to, you know, you, you are you know, testing, load testing a scenario, need 5,000 in situ instances bombarding a particular application, then you would bid for you know, a higher on demand rate and you will ac you know, access capacity and then you will get that request provision. So there are different strategies depending upon your application, depending upon your use case, select the right bidding strategy around it. So I have a variety of different examples of how customers take this into consideration. So the first bidding strategy, University of Melbourne and University of Barcelona, they wanted to do particle physics simulation, and they are you know, always bidding for reserved instances uh, near, sorry, uh, spot price which is near to the reserved instance. So in this setup, they get maximum savings because they are running lower their demand rate. Um, however, one thing which to, to note is Amazon will not charge you for the last instance hour. Uh, where your instance is terminated. So uh, in, in an aggregate, you won't lose anything, right? You are still get, no, getting the lowest price for that particular instance, even though Amazon terminated that instance during, because your spot price was higher than the bid price. The second one is Vimeo, one of my favorite examples in here. They always bid for you know, um, between the spot price history and the on-demand rate. They get maximum savings due to that, but they get around 50% savings due to that. Uh, by, so that if they bid for uh, around on-demand rate, all these savings, they will, any, any price around this area, they will see a lot of savings. The third one is a numerate. It's essentially always bids for higher than the on-demand rate. So you will see as soon as the spot price is below um, certain, uh, certain um, um, use cases, they will see maximum savings in that area. And if they feel that it is not available during that time, the spot price, spot instances, they will fail over to an on-demand instance and then provision that on-demand instance and then get that only during that time. For example, around this area, they are, pro they are leveraging on-demand instances in this scenario. And the last one, which is litmus, again, they bid above the on-demand price, much more higher than the on-demand price. They're doing email and synchronous email uh, uh, search in other areas. They, they always um, you know, bid for higher than the on-demand, so they get excess, they can leverage the excess capacity when they need it and, and leverage uh, around that area. They get around 57% savings for that. So one of the interesting aspects about, about uh, the trade-off of the spot price is the fact that you have to you know, manage this interruption process. Amazon will take away those resources uh, um, when the spot price goes above the maximum bid price. And how do you manage that interruption, and how do you architect, for your, ap architect your application so that it handles that, that failure? So there are different scenarios here. Uh, if you're running... Um, 
Elastic MapReduce, Hadoop jobs, on spot instances, instances. You can run that entire cluster on spot instances, and it will give you maximum savings. However, some of the customers don't want to, uh, no, let, don't want to miss the HDFS, the data that they have, and they don't want to if, uh, terminate that instances. So that in that scenario, they only um, uh, convert and use spot instances for their task node, and their core nodes are running. Uh, on on demand or reserved instances, so by that they can quickly provision the task node if they want in a way that will create you know um, uh, uh, they'll ma make sure that the cluster is running and they get maximum savings. And this is cur currently being utilized by Backtype, which is doing a search um, uh, and web crawling in, in use case where they always leverage Hadoop for you know, for crawling use cases and and are indexing their their jobs, however, they, they leverage ta task node to create uh, for on spot and get around 66% savings as they run most of their task node on, on, on uh, spot itself. So, and beauty about EMR or beauty about Elastic MapReduce is that it will automatically provision, Hadoop will automatically provision you know, necessary infrastructure that you need and if the, if the hot, um, EC2 instance is terminated. So in this scenario, the, you, have, you get best of both the worlds where you get the fault tolerance as well as the Hadoop, uh, the, the massive uh, parallel processing. So the second example is the video transcoding example. And this is you know, leveraging queues in your architecture to manage interruption. And how, in a typical setup, you, know, you will have Amazon EC2 instances sending raw data, your you know, AVI files, and so queuing up your jobs and then storing either in SimpleDB or DynamoDB. And you have this large cluster of transcoding servers which will actually you know, provision your, uh, or transcode your video and then store the results back into uh, the queue as well as store the results back into the uh, uh, into the converted video back into the S, into S3, and then you're monitoring this whole process, and this can lev leverage spot instances very easily. How? Essentially, by leveraging queues in between. And queues are the best ways to build highly distributed architectures. And and, and one of the most you know, one of the greatest features of SQS is the visibility timeout feature. What this allows you to do is, if you have a job in the queue. You can, uh, you, if the spot instances terminates, it will automatically reappear in the queue if it's not deleted. And that's called the visibility timeout feature. So if the EC2 instance you know, is terminated due to uh, the spot price going up, you, know, you, can, you don't have to worry because the queue is going to make sure that your, your job reappears back uh, as it was not deleted in, from that queue itself. And this visibility timeout feature allows you to create a way so you can have more resiliency in your architecture. And, and when it comes back up, it automatically starts processing, fetching the jobs from the queue, and then and, uh, and creating that way. So, so how does Vimeo um, leverage queuing mechanism? So this was an, a Vimeo example where they are running video transcoding application uh, uh, using a variety of different res uh, uh, instance types as well as a variety of different pricing models. So they have a free tier where customers upload videos and it gets transcoded. They have optimized that one for, um, for uh, reducing cost because it's a free tier. Nobody pays for it. However, it's okay to have acceptable delay limits that you upload your video and you get your video after 45 minutes or maybe an hour or over the weekend or so. So how they do is they create persistent requests. They use on-demand instances if it is delayed, and they leverage spot, spot instances and always bid for maximum bid price lower than the on-demand rate in order to really get that reduced price and optimizing for cost for their free tier offering. For their premium offering, they optimize for faster response time. People are paying for it. They cannot afford to wait for a video uh, to transcode and, and, uh, and take time. So in this scenario, they are optimizing for faster response type. Each, uh, the, the number of, res number of uh, reserved, in number of uh, premium customers have a direct relationship with the number of e reserved instances that they are purchasing. And in case, when during the weekend, when they see a big surge of traffic, uh, when lots of people are uploading video and they get time to upload video during the weekend time, no, they, 
they actually use on demand for, for that additional capacity. And even though if they don't get additional capacity in on demand, they bid a higher rate on spot in order to make sure that they maintain that SLA for that customer. So it's an amazing way to see how they use, uh, in a very smart way, reserved spot as well as uh, on demand to make sure that they you know, have the right SLA for the customer. So this is a small screenshot about how you can leverage now with persistent requests. You create a persistent request, it will stay, and then you can uh, bid for that, and you always will be charged at the spot price, even though your maximum bid price is higher than the spot price. So the different best practices that I see all the time is managing interruption. There's a best way to do is to split up your work into smaller chunks and, and make sure that you are you know, uh, incre uh, incrementing in, in a smaller uh, chunks way. The, the other way is checkpointing. Checkpointing is a way that you maintain a particular state of your application uh, at, at every single hour. And um, so either you're maintaining that state in S3 or you're maintaining it in simple DB or you're maintaining it in some other database. Since you are maintaining that state, you know where you st to restart from and resume your other jobs. So that's a great way of how you can leverage SWAT architectures in your uh, application. Also, uh, one thing which I feel is the most important is testing your application and making sure that it is highly fault tolerant. All the design principles of distributed systems, things that Werner talked about in his keynote, are extremely important in this scenario as well. You're designing for failure. If something fails, it automatically uh, and, um, sort of no notifies you or it tells you where it has stopped and then you can resume from that current state and continue your processing based on that if your persistent requests are made currently. So, so again, you know, architecting for scale, architecting for spot, architecting for spend in order to further reduce your cost and highly recommend you to leverage spot in your architectures. The, third, the fourth one seems very obvious, but it is one of the most important ways in which you can further save. Like, Every customer that I talk to are maintaining different um, you know, queuing architectures and maintaining different um, you know, monitoring architectures, monitoring use case. They have a separate instance which is, which is running Nagios and, and you know, mon creating ma monitoring stats for, for, the, for the use case. They're running a, a HA proxy on an EC2 instance, trying to make sure that they are fault tolerant and other areas. And there are you know, pros and cons to each of those architectures uh, from feature, feature side as well as from fault tolerance side. Ability to run, a, you know, having an ability to use a service versus running your own open source software on top of EC2 instance, there are going to be you know, dramatic cost savings if you run it as a, if you leverage the service. So I highly recommend you taking advantage of these services. Essentially, if you are learning load balancer, take advantage of the elastic load balancer uh, instead of running a load balancer uh, on premise, uh, uh, sorry, on, uh, on an EC2 instance. So typical savings that you will see because of running as a, because it's running a service, you don't have to worry about fault tolerance. It is a service, it will make sure that it will scale and you don't have to have a uh, no, parallel infrastructure running. Uh, same goes with other services like SNS and Q SQS and SWF, as well as no, SES, like your send mail service. You know, because it's a service, it is designed to be optimized to run in a highly distributed setup as well as for optimized for scale. So you, instead of running it in on, on EC2 instance, you'll have a leverage, uh, you'll have further savings. So you remove a bunch of your infrastructure uh, that is running on EC2 and other areas and then turn it into a service by leveraging these components of your application. So that's the, la the fourth one. And the last one, which is, um, which is also obvious, is the caching piece. Caching all the time is um, not only for the cu customer, uh, no, co for cost savings, but also for performance. And, and I see that this is one of the best ways in which uh, you can leverage. And there are multiple layers of caching that you can build. Either you have page caches and object caches, or you can have a database caching uh, uh, build it. So it will reduce the number of requests to the server, reduce the number of requests load on the database. You need a lighter database, and you have an ability to cache, um, ability to uh, you know, further save because you're running in a smaller EC2 instance type. 
So typical uh, from, a, uh, from a static uh, object caching perspective, I highly recommend you to leverage a content delivery network like CloudFront. Uh, in this scenario, you will see that the because your objects are getting, or your pages, your, your JavaScript files, your HTML files, your video files are edge cached and much more closer to the customer. They're not only having low latency for the customer, but also because of caching, you, have, you will save much more because of after, for the data transfer out charges. And that's how lots of customer leverage, like of, or the static content, as you saw, PBS, you know, uh, leveraging around 40 terabytes of, of uh, video content and, and running across on that. One of the best advantages of running CloudFront uh, or leveraging CloudFront is that if you have a streaming service and you want to, uh, you're leveraging, let's say, uh, Adobe F uh, FMS for your streaming service, then you don't need to run a separate Adobe FMS server uh, in, in, in that scenario. It has built-in streaming uh, into it. So you, that itself is cost savings running on any, versus running uh, on an EC2 instance uh, itself. If you have live streaming, however, that is, you need to run it on an EC2 instance, and, um, and Adobe FMS will, will uh, kick in and do the savings there. However, so uh, leveraging caching wherever possible is a best practice that I highly recommend, whether it is object caching and page caching, or whether it is elastic cache, uh, where you are caching your database objects and, not, and, and reducing the request on the, on the server. So these are the five different ways I would highly recommend you to leverage within your infrastructure, within your architecture, to further save on your application, further save on your infrastructure. This is the best ways this cannot happen in the on-premise setup, because you are turning off your resources when you don't need it, and you have an ability to, to further optimize and make a dramatic impact on your bottom line itself. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, concerns, qu suggestions, or feature requests, we'd love to know more about you uh, and your application use case, feel free to send me an email, uh, and I would love to update uh, with, uh, you with other questions and concerns as well. Thanks a lot. <laughs>